Our next panel offers a marvelous opportunity to hear one of the major practitioners of foreign policy at the period that we're commemorating, uh, the 1970s, the period from Nixon's uh, visit to China through the normalization of diplomatic relations, to have his reflections on events at that time. Uh, Margaret Warner, who is the moderator, uh, I think is well known to all of you as a PBS personality. And of course, Dr. Brzezinski was the national security advisor for President Clinton and played uh, President Carter and played a, uh, a, a very major role in the conclusion of the process that was started by President Nixon uh, in 1972. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Roy, uh, let's see if our mics are hot. That wasn't even very brief, and I'm going to be equally brief. Just to say that we had, we had a fascinating... It's not on. It's not on. No, not on. Can someone in charge of the microphones? Well, apparently, uh, would you say something? Let's see if yours is on. Okay, let's see. Can you hear me? Okay. Let me stand up here. Oh, there. I think, can you hear me now? Okay, great, because I think this more relaxed. So we've just had a uh, fascinating deep dive into the Nixon visit to China in 1972. And as Ambassador Roy said, there was a very important second chapter, which was the completion of normalization that President Carter achieved in 1978. And a critical player in all that on the inside and also on the outside was Dr. Brzezinski, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was the National Security Advisor at the time. So I'm just going to, Dr. Brzezinski, tell us what we need to know about that critical second step. Thank you, Margaret. Ladies and gentlemen, and I'm going to take a few seconds to respond more generally, and then we can have an exchange of views. First of all, let me say that I'm delighted to be here today and to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the really historic opening to China, which was undertaken with such great political courage by President Nixon, and was initiated with such masterful skill by my long years standing friend all the way back to student days at Harvard, namely Henry Kissinger. And I'm also very happy that I can, in this way, reciprocate Henry's participation four years ago in Beijing, which was held to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the successfully implemented decision by President Carter to establish normal diplomatic relations with China and even to engage in not so altogether secret strategic cooperation with China. The first, the Nixon Initiative, the Nixon Kissinger Initiative, produced a historically important strategic reorientation on the world scene between the United States and China. The second, four years later, produced an international realignment on the global scene between the United States and China. The first one has been rightly called the six days that changed the world. The second one can be called the six months that subsequently changed the world. The second couldn't have happened without the first. But it is also true that the second was necessary because if it hadn't happened, it wouldn't have happened for months and years. It is important to recall that President Nixon was forced out of office, some of the momentum was lost, and within the Republican Party, there was a growing campaign directed particularly at Henry, notwithstanding his remarkable historical achievement. In 1976, Vice President Nelson Rockefeller 
who was closely associated with Henry, was forced out of office. And in 1980, at the Republican convention, a great deal of conservative opposition within the Republicans to Henry's policies and to Ford's initiative surfaced, occasionally even in somewhat unpleasant circumstances. Thus, what Carter did four years after Henry's initiative was probably the only moment of time in which something significant could be undertaken to consummate the strategic reorientation in order to shape a strategic realignment. We also have to be conscious of the fact that at that time, that is to say, after the forcing out of Nixon, and until the decision by Carter to move overtly, the Chinese themselves were becoming increasingly suspicious as to the inner dynamics of the triangular relationship that emerged out of the initial Nixon Kissinger initiative. I won't bore you with all of the citations, but let me just cite a couple to you. One from Deng Xiaoping in his conversations with me. He, he was talking of the Soviet Union, and he said, I think it is using China as a pawn in order to gain more things from the United States. It is designed to hoodwink the people of the world. And from another one, from the actual head of the Chinese government of the time, Hong Hafa, he said the following, in our argument with Dr. Henry Kissinger, we said to him, you should not, the United States should not go to Moscow on the shoulders of China. The Chinese were profoundly suspicious that in this triangular game, they were being used alternatively by the Soviets and by us. And that, of course, maximized their suspicions also of us. When the president sent me to China, he gave me written instructions, which are actually attached to the memoirs of my book, and which I confess were written um, by me and by Mike Oxenberg, who played a very important role in this entire enterprise. But he gave me two oral instructions, which were germane. He said very directly to me, don't overplay the anti-Soviet angle. And he also said to me, don't flatter the Chinese. He actually put it a little more colorfully. Don't kiss their ass. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say that when it came to the second, I had no difficulty in implementing his instructions. It's people who know me that know that this is not my style. With respect to the first, I did have some difficulties. But in the process of adjusting to the tone of the discussions, the Chinese helped me. So in that sense, that particular instru instruction became somewhat moot. The conversations with Deng were very direct. As I read the transcripts of the Nixon, Mao, Kissinger, Mao, Chu, and Lai discussions, they occasionally were more elliptical. You can sense that there was a probing. With Deng, it was much more direct sometimes somewhat sarcastic on his side, or provocative to smoke out perhaps our position. But in the course of these discussions, I have to say that in a strange sort of a way, a kind of a personal bond developed between us. I actually began to like him in addition to respect him. In fact, I think in terms of my lifetime, he was one of the two most impressive political people I ever met. And he seemed to be responsive to me in a somewhat personal fashion. 
characterized by two incidents, which in a way illustrate it. One, he and his wife came on the first day in America on a state visit to a totally private dinner with my family. Uh, and both of them came. Secondly, after I left office in 81, he invited me, my wife, and my three children to be his guests in China for about 10 days. Uh, and that was absolutely memorable. Nonetheless, in the conversations with me, he frequently carped and probed. For example, when I told him that the United States has now decided to move forward on normalization. After an earlier visit by Secretary Vance, which left things somewhat in abeyance, he on several occasions rather, I thought sardonically said to me, well, if President Carter has made up his mind, so much so that on the third occasion, I actually snapped and I said to him, look, I've told you a couple of times already, President Carter has made up his mind, if we're serious about it, let's start secret negotiations next month. And that got his attention. And I also said to him, the secret negotiations would be conducted in Beijing by our extremely able ambassador Woodcock, back in Washington, by the White House. And he, he then responded to that. Nonetheless, he still kept probing, in keeping with the previously noted by me, suspicion that we may be playing a game in which the Soviets are playing a game with both of us using China. He said to me a couple of times something to the effect, are you fearful of the Chinese? Uh, for example, after denouncing the Vladivostok Agreement, which Henry and uh, Ford discussed with Brezhnev, which wasn't consummated, he denounced it as in his view, an excessive concession by the United States. I repeat, his view. He then turned to me and said, perhaps, and I'm quoting now, perhaps I think you have the fear of offending the Soviet Union. Is that right? Well, that really annoyed me. <laughs> so I said to him, and I quote, I can assure you that my inclination to be fearful of offending the Soviet Union is rather limited. Indeed, I would be willing to make a little bet with you as to who is less popular in the Soviet Union, you or me. He was rather surprised by that and said, it is hard to say. <laughs> and of course, I was referring to the fact that uh, the Soviets were waging, were waging this war on me personally as responsible for difficulties in American Soviet relations. I also told him, and I quote, I honestly do not think it is useful for you to criticize us as appeasing the Soviets. And then I went on to say that for 30 years we have opposed the Soviets while you were collaborating with them. And now you still sign agreements with them. And we're not accusing you of manipulating us. In these discussions, as they went on, increasingly it became also evident that the Chinese wanted some overt demonstration of our commitment and reassurance that we are not playing the triangular game. And that assurance, interestingly enough, was actually a question of words which the Chinese wanted us to use as a form of litmus test, namely, a commitment to anti-hegemony opposition, which was their favorite phrase. In the US government, we have some disagreement on whether to use it, but in, the, but in the written instructions which I was given, it was written and signed by the president that we were committed to a posture that was anti-hegemonic. So I interpreted that as consistent with the general instructions I got from the president. And then I told him that we are quite prepared to use that phrase. And not only that, but I will help to get the Japanese to use it. And on my way home, I stopped in Tokyo, 
and I had a meeting with Prime Minister Fukuda. And they were concerned as to whether to use that phrase, but because they knew of our earlier reticence in using it. Chick, chick, hee, hee. And I could tell him there, right on there, that we will use it. And I told Prime Minister Fukuda that from our standpoint, we were open to using it, and therefore they should go ahead as well, and they did. Of course, the difficult points were the questions pertaining to Taiwan itself. And there we explicitly said, we now accept the three conditions about no diplomatic relations, full normalization, and the question of arms sales would have check, to be check. Hey, hey. One, two. The phrase I kept using repeatedly was, during the historically transitional phase, when that issue is resolved by the Chinese themselves, in keeping with the Nixon-Kissinger approach, we will continue service, but we'll adjust them in a spirit that is in conformity with the historically transitional phase during which the Chinese themselves work it out. And we agreed after prolonged sparring that we will express the hope that this issue will be resolved peacefully, reserving the right of sale. But it is not a condition that the Chinese must abide by. They can stay their own position. And that is the way it worked out. Unfortunately, and there was a real snafu here. On the very day the normalization was to be announced, in the consequence of the negotiations that continued for about six months on the details and specifics, and specifics it became apparent that Dunn was operating on the assumption, or was pretending to be operating on the assumption, that arms sales to Taiwan will be discontinued immediately and during the one year during which the defense treaty with Taiwan will expire and will then continue to be suspended after that. Whereas our position, as we negotiated with the Chinese was, it will be suspended during that year, but it will continue afterwards, but in a keeping with the historic the transitional phase, meaning depending on circumstances. We got word from Woodcock in Beijing that Dong is assuming this continuation. And our ambassador was reluctant to reopen that. We had a communique ready to go that evening. So I turned the cable to Woodcock saying, no, you have to go back in and clarify that. Because it would be worse if after the issuance of the communique there was a breakdown. It's better to have a breakdown and postpone the communique, which we could do just like that, or let's work this out. Dunn was concerned, according to Woodcock, shocked. It may have been genuine, it may have been an act. But when it became clear to him that there was no give, we can either postpone the announcement or we go with it, in which we say, in effect, that this is not discontinued after one year. Uh, he decided to go along with it. In effect, agreeing to disagree without the issue surfacing. And that's how it worked out. And of course, we do know that things have changed in the relationship between Taiwan and China. But that was the critical moment. The result of this, in effect, was a new strategic alignment characterized, one, by normal diplomatic relations, Two, not generally known, by the initiation and endurance of critically important intelligence cooperation with China, directed at, I think we all know who, without it being said. Three, strategic cooperation shortly thereafter regarding such difficult issue as Vietnam and Cambodia in which the Chinese have been given us warning in advance, here in Washington, when Don came here, staged a limited military operation against Vietnam, and we gave them international protection by sponsoring reactions in the UN 
designed to call upon the Chinese to discontinue. Permitted us to be against unilateralism and the use of military power, but in a larger strategic context in which the other side, the Vietnamese by, by, backed by the Soviets, were expected to do the same. Fourth, subsequently, within a year, in a, it involved joint efforts, literally joint efforts, joint military efforts to oppose the Soviets in Afghanistan. That is still part of history, but it is a part of history, even if it is not all that well known. Fifth, it resulted in trade and scientific and educational cooperation rapidly blossomed. Sixth, we have continued arms sales to Taiwan, but in a context in which Taiwan and China are moving to closer relations. Literally, hundreds of thousands of people go back and forth now. Major Taiwanese investments in Shanghai, a retirement area for Thai rich Taiwanese businessmen around Shanghai. Growing closer together, and as circumstances change, that presumably will continue. And then eventually, when I visited China, Mao Shoping's guest, he used my presence in fact, photographically demonstrated when Renmin Rinbao announced his new formula for Taiwan, with me and him being there together when he did it. Namely, one China, two systems formula. One China, part of the Nixon Kissinger communique, but two systems, but in fact, not just two. There's one system for China, one for Hong Kong already, one for China and Macau. And hence, I rather expect this will evolve over time into one China, several systems. The distinctive aspect being, eventually, no PLA forces on Taiwan itself within one state formula, which eventually will evolve. I think this means an important change in the relationship, and it meant that at the time. It also facilitated something which is not connected directly, usually, but which Mike Oxenberg, who really helped me and shaped me on this issue, warned me about. Namely, this now facilitates Dunn's decision to launch an economic transformation of China, a shift away from the state-controlled economic system to a wide-ranging reform based on international trade, including particularly with the United States which transformed the China we have seen. It is now essential, therefore, to make certain that this strategic reorientation that then led to the strategic realignment continues in the direction of an enduring Chinese-American, American-Chinese partnership. In different ways, Henry has talked about it, I have talked about it. I think we have to be careful to nurture this because there are pressures to push us into a confrontation. There is a growing tendency towards demonization of us by them, of them by us. I have to confess I felt uncomfortable at the state luncheon for Vice President Xi, which took the following form. We all waited for about two hours for the first course to be set from 12.30 to 2.25 p.m. I timed it because after having soup, I got up and left because I had other things I had to go and do. But we listened to a long welcome, very generous, by the Secretary of State, then translated into Chinese, which takes 1.5 more time, then an even lengthier statement by the Vice President, also translated into Chinese, at a ratio of time 1.5 Chinese to English, which involved largely a series of complaints about Chinese conduct, which the Chinese Vice President had to stand and listen to, following which he then made his previously prepared response, not responding to that. 
I don't think we probably would have appreciated if Vice President Biden was a state visitor to China and was exposed to that kind of a welcome. We have to be careful. But this is not only a matter of words. This is also a matter of concrete issues. In my just published book, which deals in part with the American-China relationship, but not exclusively, called Strategic Vision, I argue that in the American-Chinese relationship, we have to address three very serious, strategic, tangible issues. One, the scope of our ongoing air and naval patrols right up to Chinese territorial limits. We're conducting this. There are risks involved in this. The Chinese sent up aircraft to monitor our aircraft. They come awfully close to ours. There could be incidents. I don't think we would be happy if the Chinese were conducting such air patrols and naval patrols next, next to, let's say, San Diego. The second is military buildup. The Chinese will have a significant military buildup in the years to come. Next year, they're planning to spend close to $100 billion on military capability. That's still considerably slower, smaller than ours. It's much larger than of any other country in the world. We have to have serious strategic talks regarding that issue so that we don't get into an increasing mutual suspicion regarding our respective intentions. And last but not least, at some point in the course of the next decade, I think we'll have to address, maybe not directly, but indirectly, the issue of Taiwan. That's not going to wait indefinitely as China becomes more important and more assertive in the Far East. That issue will have to be faced, hopefully by indirection. The best outcome would be for the Chinese to work this out themselves within the framework of the original Nixon-Kissinger Committee, and as modified by what was done by Carter. I think we have to be realistic about this and patient, but also sensitive to the meaning of this issue to the Chinese, because that does involve an issue of national integrity and self-definition. In brief, we're going to be tested in years to come. And just as Nixon and Kissinger, and then subsequently as Carter, and to some extent myself, so too in the years to come, there will be yet another moment in which an important American response to these issues would be needed. But that is all for the good if we approach it with a strategic perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kissinger. We're going to go to questions from the presents, audience. The very, the um, Dr. Brzezinski. Oh, what a terrible <laughs> faux pas. <laughs> I'm looking right at Aunt Henry right now. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple quick questions, but then we're going to the audience. <laughs> so let me just ask you this. In your book, in all the other books on this, even though you said China was very concerned we weren't playing a double game vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union, in fact, the perception, as you describe it, of the Soviet threat was very much an animating principle, was it not, for both the United States and for China in pursuing this? Oh yes, you're absolutely right. Although in all fairness, I have to say that during the first year in the Carter administration, there were some significant differences of opinion on the subject at the very high levels. And there was a different school of thought which tended to, by and large, minimize uh, the Soviet problem and was a little skeptical about moving the way we did move and more in keeping with what was started by Nixon and Kissinger. But both for the Chinese and for your administration, there was a perception at the time that the Soviet threat was quite great and that this would be a useful counter move. Yes, you're quite right, but I do say that in the first year, of our administration. This was not a universal position, and the president himself tended initially to have perhaps more optimistic expectations 
regarding the possibility of a more comprehensive arms control arrangement with the Soviets than proved feasible. So that takes me to my second question, was, which was, what was the evolution of President Carter's thinking? Because in the early part of your description, it sounds as if he was unsure about how, how quickly, how much of a priority, at least, this should be vis-a-vis -vis the priority of pursuing some sort of arm, uh, pursuing an arms control treaty with the, with the Soviets. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. We inherited an ongoing process which in Vladivostok seemed to point to a possible solution, although the Chinese were objecting to it as going too far in being concessionary to the Soviets. Within our administration, there was a division of opinion on this. The president himself wanted dramatic cuts with the Soviets, which then threw the Soviets off the trail, of the rails, so to speak, because it went all of a sudden, to a far greater extent, than the earlier discussions with Nixon or the Republicans. So there was division in the administration. Secondly, the president wanted to consummate the Panama Canal issue, which was politically very costly to him, but he felt he could only do it in the first year. And I think he was right in that judgment. Incidentally, that's where Obama actually missed the opportunity on the Middle Eastern peace, because the moment to act was in the first year and not in the second as he did, and then he got rebuffed. But that's merely an aside. The point is, the first year is the year of opportunity for, for costly presidential initiatives. So Obama wanted to, come, to Carter wanted to consummate the Panama Canal issue. In the meantime, to accommodate with the Chinese on the basis of the status quo, which they rebuffed when Secretary Vance went there. Then got in Panama, he decided to bite the bullet on the Chinese. We're going to go to audience questions. Raise, yes, raise your hand. The lady in the pink suit there. If you just wait for the mic, please give your name and your affiliation and uh, your question. Uh, my name is Hong Liu, and uh, in Chinese, Liu Hong. I call myself the daughter of President Nixon and Chairman Mao Zedong's era. I'm affiliated to President Nixon's foundation. I have one request. President Nixon and Chairman Mao aided with genius think tanks like Dr. Henry Kissinger and the doctors in Chinese side to pave the way for peace. What we can do to help build peace? Because when I met my husband 25 years ago, he asked me, are you from bad China or good China? I said, I'm from good China the People's Republic of China. I'm a school teacher. I'm a public school teacher. And I couldn't help tell you, people at the bottom, students, parents, they love to know everything about the Far East to Asia. And so, I want to contribute 100,000 to Nixon Foundation to build the group image of peace. Okay, thank you. Lastly, I want to apply it to I, the Middle East. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Let me just take your question. Follow follow up, which is something the Chinese foreign minister said in his address here, I don't know if you heard it, which is that this could be at the century of win-win cooperation between the U.S. and China. Do you think that's realistic? What would it take? Okay, We're we getting a little feedback here. Yeah. You know, I think the United States and China face a unique opportunity, which is not predetermined necessarily and for which there are no precedents, and which nonetheless, I would argue, makes sense in terms of fitting into the new historical circumstances in which we find ourselves. Namely, for most of known history of international politics on the global scale, there was global competition for supremacy. And that, domin that dominated world affairs. It was a reflection of the West. The last century had three major wars, the essence of which, one of which was peaceful, uh, non-military, which the essence of which was global domination. And that means when two powers compete, the end result is the elimination of one of the two. I don't think that lesson of history necessarily is destined to endure. In fact, I'm not sure it even corresponds to reality anymore. The world is so complex that no one power can dominate it. And in that sense, 
A struggle for hegemony between just two makes less and less sense. I would argue that if the United States falters, the world is not going to be Chinese. It's going to be chaotic. But if the United States and China can cooperate, I think we have a better chance of creating a degree of equilibrium internationally that enables all of us to benefit. That is the challenge to American and to Chinese statesmanship. But that means that both of them have to be aware of it and responsive to it and try also to contain the almost inevitable social pressures, political pressures, to exaggerate frictions, to elevate them to a point of vital national interest, and to engage in a reciprocal demonization. But that is a responsibility we share in common. One side cannot cover with it, tackle with it, and resolve it on its own. Next question, yes, right there. My name is Stephen Short. Did Jimmy Carter, as president, ever visit China? And if not, oh, why not? He has visited quite a few times. So the rest of the question, I don't have to answer. Yes, right here. Hello, Dr. Brzezinski. Um, I'm Randall Doyle. I work for the uh, Lao Guy Research Speak Institution. Loud, I, I'm Randall Doyle. I work for the uh, Lao Guy Research Foundation. And I'd like to ask you about human rights. And as you know, human rights was one of the fundamental pillars of President Carter's foreign policy approach. What were the realities and some of the, um, I guess, some of the realities that you encountered dealing with China that you could only push that, that issue so far without maybe sacrificing uh, an agreement that would move the U.S. Chinese relations further down the road? Well, you know, oh, practice, can people hear the question? The question had to do with human rights. I see people not shaking their head. Basically, how did President Carter's emphasis on human rights, how were you able to handle that with the Chinese, and to what degree did one have to give way to the other? I'm well, paraphrasing. You know, th there is no difference, really, between President Carter's approach to human rights and to arms control with the Soviet Union, or human rights with China, and an improved relations with China. That is to say, both are desirable, but you have to make a reasonable judgment as to how much is feasible. If you think that stabilizing an external relationship is a value in itself, you take that into account and it moderates to some extent the degree of emphasis you place on human rights. If you can have human rights without being fearful of the negative consequences of a deterioration in other relationships, you can press the issue more. To put it very crudely and simply, if the party involved is powerful, the adjustment has to be more prudent. If the party involved is weak, you can squeeze them as much as you want in order to get human rights. Well, obviously, Russia, the Soviet Union, and China are not in the same category as some country in Latin America or elsewhere in the world where you can concentrate on the human rights without worrying about the military political aspects of the relationship. Ultimately, it's common sense. I think we have time for just one question and the gentleman in the back there. John San with CTI TV of Taiwan. Dr. Brzezinski, you were talking about the, uh, the three issues that the U.S. has to uh, discuss with China or resolve with China. One of them is Taiwan. How do you expect the uh, United States and China to resolve the Taiwan issue? Uh, could you uh, elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, there have been calls uh, uh, in some circles for some kind of uh, rethinking about U.S. Uh, arms sales to Taiwan, and uh, some even go uh, even further about abandoning Taiwan. Thank you. Well, actually, you know, at the risk of producing <clears throat> some resentment or controversy, I do say in my book that it is, in my judgment, not realistic to assume that the United States can indefinitely be the source of arms for Taiwan so that it can, because of the availability of these arms, 
maintain a distinctive relationship with China without that negatively affecting eventually the American-Chinese relationship. That is, in my judgment, just a matter of common sense. However, I also do think that in the long run, the relationship between China and Taiwan will be resolved on the basis of accommodation between the two parties, depending on the scale of China's own national success, which will have geopolitical consequences, and also depending on the degree to which China and Taiwan grow closer together by peaceful expansion of closer and closer ties, creating, in effect, de facto, a situation in which one China, several systems, becomes reality. One China is what was acknowledged in the Nixon Mao communique, Shanghai communique, reaffirmed by the United States subsequently. One China. But the variety of arrangements within one China is a question for the Chinese to decide, not for us to decide. And I think with sensitivity we can resolve this. I remember that when, and I'll end on this, when Don came to dinner to my house, you know, there was general conversation, chit-chat, but sometimes there were kind of pauses. So I decided to tease him a little bit about the nature of our relations, and maybe subtly to remind him how democratic we are and how yet a long road they have to travel towards democracy. So I said to him, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, you know, when we normalize relations with you, and when you normalize relations with us, the President of the United States had a lot of difficulties in Congress with American public opinion. Uh, and I was sort of, you know, saying to him, we are democracy. Uh, did you have any difficulties in normalizing relations with us? And just like that, just like that, Deng Xiaoping, who had a good sense of humor, answered, oh yes, of course we had a great deal of difficulties. There was a great deal of political opposition in the province of Taiwan. Test one, two, 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 test one,